She's the former U.S. ambassador to Denmark who last served during the Trump administration. She's also the vice chair at the Center for Energy and Environment at the America First Policy Institute. Always excited to sit down and have a wonderful conversation with Ambassador Carla Sands. Welcome back to the show. Hey, it's great to be. With, I love being with Steak for Breakfast. We love hosting you, and we're going to get right into the biggest topic of the week. We're doing a big preview of it on our show today, but we'd like to get some commentary for someone who worked a little bit closer to the breast throughout the course of the last eight plus years or so, and that's the first presidential debate set for Thursday night in prime time down in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Miss Ambassador, we know that this is going to be huge for Donald Trump. I mean, it's been a long time since he's been on the debate stage with Joe Biden. The last time we saw it, you had the mainstream press and Joe Biden making uh, excuses for the hunt. Hunter Biden laptop, the 51 former intelligence officials, all of their fair violations and business dealings and everything of that nature. In addition, we've all got to live, unfortunately, under Joe Biden's open border and globalist policies for the last three plus years. Americans are reaping the unrewards of that across the country. It seems like the president has a tall task. If there was anybody I'd bet money on for uh, being able to win a debate where he's going to be up against Joe Biden and at least two moderators, I think it would be Donald Trump. But I'd like to get your kind of uh, preview commentary on and headed into it. Well, it's a great question. Of course, I'll be watching the debate, as I imagine most of your listeners will, uh, if not in real time, then, um, you know, when they can catch it. Uh, you know, it's true. In 2020, when Donald Trump was debating Joe Biden, Trump was at that time the sitting U.S. president. He he wasn't just debating Joe Biden. He was debating the moderators, even when it was a so-called friendly venue. If you remember on Fox, I mean, they they shut down every credible inquiry that Donald Trump made into Joe Biden. They covered for him on everything, wouldn't let him talk about foreign policy where he was just kicking it. Remember, under Dr Donald Trump, President Trump, we had no new foreign wars. The last 18 months of Af Afghanistan, no service member lost their lives. We had the historic Abraham Accords. We had a first ever U.S. president meet with the head of North Korea and begin a process of de-escalation. There were no big tests during President Trump's uh, term, which now things have really escalated. And we have a, a terrible alignment of Iran, North Korea, China, and Russia, yes. which is the, the worst thing that could have happened, which President Trump was working to prevent from happening. But we also had, you know, beginning of peace around the world, um, he defeated ISIS. We had the quietest border in my adult lifetime. He had done those those deals. And, you know, he had to use negotiating skills that he has. But he, we had peace at the southern border as well. You know, you talked about that. I think that's a huge thing. Taxes, tariffs, sanctions. And then in the case of like ISIS is al-Baghdadi or a Soleimani from Iran, you know, they pay the ultimate consequence for, for bad foreign policy. But you're right. Donald Trump was, you know, a successful businessman, to say the least, before he ran for president. He used a lot of those negotiation tactics to kind of convince world leaders, whether they were geo old political allies or foes. America first was the way that we were going to go. And there's a way that everybody could win in this situation, but it's going to be making a lot more concessions. I think uh, global organizations like NATO found out the hard way, just how that looks. So did the WHO and, and the Paris Climate Accord enthusiasts across the country. But here's the deal. I mean, under Joe Biden, w Americans have gotten absolutely destroyed in every context of their life. There's not a, a street in the America right now that's safe to walk down. And, and you know, just seeing the, the recent rampant crime that's uh, ramped up all across the country you you can't go and make that argument and say there's anything against it in addition to that you see the price of everything uh nearly doubled since joe biden took office it costs more than 70 percent of your paycheck to keep a roof over your head hot food on the table and uh energy to either get back and forth to work or heat or cool your home and, and then there's everything in between i mean you touched on a little bit of the failed foreign policies of joe biden but you know just to see him on display uh, a little over a week ago at the g7 and the d-day remembrance it's just an absolute mm -hmm. embarrassment so when you see these two going head to head. I don't think that CNN is going to allow Donald Trump the platform to kind of apologize for not allowing Joe Biden to get fact checked in real time when he was saying, you know, 51 former intelligence officials and we never received any kind of money from places like Moscow or Ukraine or Romania or wherever they were, you know, getting their funds from. But do you think that at least in the context of policies that this uh, outlet that has been 
you know, completely inappropriate in their behavior this week. Earlier on Monday, cutting off Caroline Levitt mid-interview, you've got Jake Tapper and uh, Dana Bash going out and saying nasty things about Donald Trump over the course of the last several years, comparing him to Hitler, saying it was unfortunate that the Supreme Court was going to allow Donald Trump to remain on the presidential ballot and give our former president and Republican nominee a platform to talk about and promote America first and how life was better during his administration. My gosh, you've just said it all. Do you remember when debates in America were just neutral platforms for the candidates to tell their story to the voters? Oh, my gosh. Now we have enemies of one of the uh, candidates, President Donald Trump. Jake Tacker, Tapper hates him, has been openly hateful about him and spiteful. Dana Bash hates him. The network you saw cutting off that beautiful spokeswoman. She's adorable. She's the best. President Trump spokeswoman and very articulate. Didn't want to hear the truth. No truth allowed. So I'm worried that they're setting President Trump up, but he's very canny. He's been in the lion's den before. Um, I've heard that he's requested that Joe Biden take a, a, a drug test. That's a great idea. I don't think he'll get it because there, there's, you know, clearly he's drugged up for these big events. Sure. That's why he said it. And then you saw Dr. Ronnie Jackson, who's a current uh, congressman from Texas. He was he was Barack Obama's doctor, George W. Bush's doctor and uh, President Trump's doctor. He said that Joe Biden should take a cognitive test. And he just sent a letter to all the members of Congress requesting this. It's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. And then, you know, following the debate, we could start to, you know, get back to the basics. We'll, we'll have a little bit less than a month before. Well, unfortunately, Donald Trump gets his conviction in regards to the New York case uh, up in Manhattan. But then we'll have the RNC, which should be extremely celebratory. Hopefully, Donald Trump is able to attend it in person. He'll also be making the announcement for his vice presidential pick. You know, quick commentary. Uh, Ambassador Sands, you've seen the field narrowed down to a handful of very legitimate and, and viable contenders for the VP. Have you been watching anybody in particular, or do you like the entirety of the field? You know, I love the field. I think they're great. We have such a great farm team. I think they all bring different skills. I have to say, um, I appreciate the way J.D. Vance has been a real fighter um, and a real America firster. The American people really want somebody to fight for them and make their lives better. We saw how easy it is. Well, maybe not so easy, but if you intend to do and you have good policies like President Trump's uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act and how that just was like rocket fuel for the economy, reducing regulations, increasing the uh, manufacturing in the U.S. so that those jobs were coming back, all that was just so good for the American people. But I, I do um, I do think that President Trump will win the debate, even though they're all aligned against him beha- because he has such a command of the facts. And he's a likable man. I know him personally, and he's he's a great guy. Yeah, he does bring a little bit of that comedic sense to the table. But I think when you talk about I, I really like how, you know, some of the information that was presented to the press over the course of the last few weeks is that Donald Trump was preparing a lot less to debate and a lot more to know everything about the successes of his policies throughout the first course of his administration and what that means for a second Trump term. I think that presentation to the American people where everybody is kind of in dire straits, at least financially right now, uh, when you when you look at the amount of debt and how much everything costs, and we're just heading into the, the, the gist of the summer months, the dog days here, I think it's going to be something that, you know, you see him go into places uh, that aren't necessarily Republican strongholds like New York City and Philadelphia recently. And the Bronx. And, yes, and, and just have these massive turnouts of people who understand that life was better and they want that back again. I think that's the best messaging for the president. And I think that's a really good point you make. I do want, you know, you work on a lot of policy stuff and potentially policy that's going to be uh, enacted in the course of a second Trump administration. And, and two of the big ones right now, they kind of connect to each other. It, it's what's going on down on the border and it's what's going on with American energy and lack of independence under Joe Biden. You know, we were so close to being energy dominant under Donald Trump. And, and I just think that, you know, all of the re-regulations and red tape and things that Joe Biden is just abandoned as far whether it's the xl pipeline or even uh places that were set to get started up to to be drilling in and and fracking in that he abandoned throughout the course of his presidency 
these are things on day one we could start, you know, reinvesting in and, and over the course of a very short time seeing results for the American public. So as we're getting ready to think potentially about a second Donald Trump term in office, how are you looking at some of these regulations and uh, policy points that are going to benefit the American people? And, and what are the ones that you want to see as part of like the first 100 days agenda re-implemented for the Americans? Well, you know, I'm working with America First Policy Institute. I'm the vice chair for energy and environment there. I'm also their Pennsylvania State Chapter Chair, and then I'm a Senior Advisor to America First Works, and that's the C4 arm. And I'm really excited to tell your listeners that we're working on executive uh, or orders, these EEOs that President Trump has asked for. So we're working on those. We're also, we helped draft the first two bills out of the current Congress. It was called HR1 and HR2. Great HR1 bills. was an unbelievable energy bill that literally would unleash America's economy. It just wasn't about energy. It also was about deregulating all kinds of industry. So it would benefit all businesses and it would help build good paying jobs. The other bill, HR2, was about the border. And it was about securing the border because we know exactly how to do it, because President Trump showed us how to do it. All of these things he demonstrated in his first term. So when people say crazy things like he's going to be a dictator or President Trump's going to do this or that or the end of so-called democracy, just remember, we had the best economy of our lifetimes during President Trump's administration. And I'm a Reagan Republican. His policies were even better. In fact, I was just out at the Reagan ranch a few days ago. Oh, wow. But- yeah. Um, so I, I think that looking at the field and what he's going to do this time around is not like 2016. We are so ready for day one and we're ready to um, to push forward it with every legal means necessary, beneficial policies to make America great again and to benefit everybody in our country. You can't say it any clearer than that. I mean, it's literally the receipts we're bringing from the last administration. You would think that in the last four years on the back end of a second Trump term, we would see that on steroids, uh, both literally and metaphorically. And, and we would hope for big benefits on the uh, for the American people. And then foreign wise, you know, I want to talk to you this because your experience as an ambassador, you got to meet with so many different world leaders. You got to see the way the world changed, responded, and then kind of flourished peacefully under Donald Trump throughout the course of his first term in office. And what we've seen over the course of the last couple of years, especially coming out of the pandemic, where we saw just a lot of shady global tactic that set the world back decades when you want to talk about the, you know, overall labor market of the world, the global economy, education for an entire generation of people throughout the world who were shuttered in, you know, distance learning for sometimes years in a lot of cases, especially here in the United States. But then when you look at the gold standard of like people who put their country first, obviously you start and end with Victor Orban, but the rise of people like Bukele, Malay, uh, you've got Maloney in uh, Italy, you've got Le Pen resonating now in France, you've got Nigel Farage in the UK, who I think he really feels like Donald Trump's going to win because he's thrown his hat back into the political arena. You see the rise of nationalism and populism spreading throughout the world, things that Donald Trump promoted throughout his first term in office. How is this going to be to set up like alliances with all of these people to make sure that, you know, the world is not only safe, but very prosperous again, like it was during the first Trump administration? You know, it's a great question. We saw how Brexit preceded President Trump's election, right? Elections have consequences. Things that r happen in one continent do affect other continents and affect the world. So if people, I'm hearing that people in other countries in very, you know, kind of leftist socialist Europe are saying privately to Americans, if President Trump's not reelected, it's the end of America and it's the end of, you know, controlled government and sovereignty, national sovereignty, because we see that the UN and the World Economic Forum is attempting to kind of roll up in, in some ways under the WHO yep. to have a global governance. And some of it, it's under the climate, uh, you know, so-called climate change agenda um, that there's a kind of world cabal uh, attempting to take away the sovereignty of each nation. It's They're very aggressive and, and they're being highly effective. So um, if President Trump is elected, we are able to stop that or at least slow it enough that we can help the world change course. And by world, I mean, control, you know, keep the national sovereignty 
Nobody dies and fights for the world. They die and fight for their nation and their people, their kindred. And so, um, you know, I, I, I really, you mentioned some of the leaders that are very, very exciting, like Bukele, mm -hmm. who my friend was the ambassador to El Salvador and saw the rise of Bukele and what he's done to bring peace. They have peace in Bukele. It has the lowest crime of any nation in our hemisphere. But what happened? A lot of their criminals came to the U.S. Correct. once Joe Biden opened up the doors. Just like in Venezuela, there's crime is down over 70% in their cities, while it's gone up over 60% in our cities. Well, there's a reason. It's because the criminals, the people from, you know, the bad people are coming here. President Trump was not right. Now, are some people coming here and deserve asylum? Sure, maybe one, two, three percent. And the rest, maybe. The rest are fighting age men from places like China and Syria and 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 they look like some bad hombres. Yeah. I looked at them. They're not, you know, they're not good guys necessarily. Well, I mean, you're right up there with the numbers of uh, actual people who gain asylum. And then when you look at all the other people, we, we just want to remind our listenership is people like Tom Holman and anyone else who, who served in the prior administration or has any experience in regard to how DHS works. <laughs> Claiming you want to come to the United States for a better life is not a legitimate asylum claim. So for the nearly 20 million people that are going to try and sneak in here by the time Joe Biden leaves office, there's going to be a lot of them who are hopefully leaving expeditedly when Donald Trump retakes the White House in January of next year. Ambassador, this has been fantastic catching up with you today. What a great segment for our listenership to kind of enjoy. We love to get your perspective, not only on behalf of the America First Policy Institute, but with all the experience you've had throughout the course of your service to this country, in addition to the close relationship you have with President Trump and America First. We've obviously got your website and your page at the America First Policy Institute live linked in the show description today. But if there's anywhere else we want to check you out, especially on social media, where can we find you? Well, I'm mostly I'm hottest on Twitter and then I'm a little bit on all the other platforms. Um, but I really am so happy to uh, to talk to your listeners. I think we do need alliances with like minded countries. I was just in Estonia talking to them about NATO and, you know, contributions, which is really important to President Trump. And then also about the Ukraine war, because that is an issue. We don't want our young men and women going to Ukraine and fighting. Sure that is we are not we are not intending to get into a war with Russia. So um, America first isn't. So anyway, great to talk to you. Thanks so much. Always a pleasure. And we'll be looking to have you back in July as well. This is the former ambassador to Denmark and the vice chair at the Center for Energy and Environment at the America First Policy Institute. Ambassador Carlos Sanz, thanks for joining us today. Have a great rest of your week.